Okay, hi everyone. I think we can get started. So um, today we're very likely, lucky to have uh, Stephen Mont. Uh, he's an assistant professor of computer science at UC Irvine. And before that, uh, he was a senior researcher and head of the statistical machine learning group at Disney, um, first in Pittsburgh and then in LA. And before that, um, he was a, um, a postdoc at Columbia University and Princeton University. Um, he's originally a physicist by training. Um, he has a PhD in theoretical physics from the University of Cologne. Um, he's a fellow of the German National Merit Foundation, a Kavli Fellow of the US National Academy of Sciences, and was a visiting researcher at Google Brain. And he's done interesting work in a lot of areas of machine learning that um, builds on ideas for physics and, and elsewhere. And we're actually um, covering some of it in the course I'm teaching this term. So I'll hand it over to Stephen. Yeah, thank you very much, Roger. It's a great pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for making this possible. Um, yeah, to, the title of my talk today is uh, Compressing Variational Base. And as some of you might have realized who are familiar with variational autoencoder, of course, that refers to the VAE paper. So let me get started with something that's um, you know, almost redundant. Um, so we have all very familiar, we're all very familiar with deep learning and we know that it already affects all areas of our lives, uh, ranging from totally different domains. Um, however, even though probabilistic deep learning um, is actually highly appealing, uh, it is actually rarely encountered in industrial applications. Um, and so what I wanna to do today is, um, even though I uh, oftentimes also talk about more theoretical aspects, this is gonna be primarily an applied talk and I want to talk about um, demonstrating how variational inference and even kind of relatively, you know, sophisticated advancements of variational inference can be actually highly useful in, in industrial applications and in particular in image and video compression, which is one of the topics that I've been working on recently. So having said that, let's kind of get started pretty high level and get everyone on the same page. Um, so I'll talk a lot about deep latent variable models, which I'm sure you're all familiar with already. Um, so you can think of that as sort of uh, a neural network uh, flipped upside down in the sense that you start with a low dimensional noise variable that you push through a trained network and you wanna generate something typically high dimensional such as a real looking image, right? So we'll talk uh, we call Z a latent variable because it's kind of unobserved and it summarizes um, everything that you have to know um, about this high dimensional data point. Um, and in deep latent variable models, there are certainly multiple, sorry, multiple purposes um, or multiple goals that you might have in mind. Um, so ultimately you want to find Z as the best explanation of your observed data. And you can use that for uh, either data generation when you really care about generation. So for example, uh, you know, voice language image generation, maybe super resolution if you care about um, increasing the resolution of videos or images. Um, sometimes we care about representation learning where you know, say we want to do unsupervised learning on a large unlabeled data set and then later on use these learned representations somewhere else. Um, and sometimes we mostly care about density estimation, for example, in anomaly detection but also in compression, turns out. And this is actually what we'll talk about mainly today. Um, turns out that the workhouse uh, workhorse um, of what I'm gonna talk about today is gonna be variational inference, um, where um, we assume that we have a probabilistic model P uh, over data Z and, uh, sorry, over data X and parameters or latent variable Z that factorizes into a likelihood in the prior. We're interested in the posterior distribution, P of Z given X. So in other words, how much does my distribution over latent variables change as I make observations? And we know that this is kind of proportional to the joint distribution, but divided by the normalization constant P of Z, which is intractable com to compute. And in instead of trying very hard to compute that posterior normalization constant or doing something else, we are rather um, interested in approximating that posterior with a simpler distribution Q um, that is parameterized by certain variational parameters lambda. And ultimately we want to tune these parameters lambda to achieve the best matching between the posterior and that family of distributions. So for example, here in a one dimensional toy example, this could be the posterior, this bimodal distribution and we are sort of approximating it um, by um, a unimodal Gaussian distribution in which case the mean and variance would be the variational parameters. And of course this field has a very long history 
for um, you know, more recent review articles, um, I'm also providing some references. So the objective function that we optimize in variational inference is the so-called evidence lower bound um, because it's a lower bound to the um, data likelihood um, um, uh, of, of your model. Um, and that can be written in terms of two terms. So there are many ways of decomposing the elbow, but here's a very common one that will be useful in data compression. So it can be written as the expectation under your Q distribution of the log likelihood, P of X given Z. And so this term tries to sort of place Q such that it optimally explains the data so that you find the optimal model parameters in some sense. But with only that term, there would be no entropy and the Q distribution would collapse to a delta peak. And therefore we also have another term here which is the KL divergence between your Q distribution and your prior. And you know, sometimes we like to add a better term here that in pure Bayesian applications is usually set to one, but in um, other applications, you kind of also sometimes allow for smaller or for different values from one, as you'll see later. Right? So this maps um, variational inference, uh, the Bayesian inference problem to an optimization problem. Um, Yet another sort of introductory slide here is on variational autoencoders. I also assume that a lot of you are already familiar with that concept. So the idea is that you sort of have an encoder and a decoder that gets you from the data space to some lower dimensional bottleneck. And then from there back to the data space using neural networks. Um, but importantly, this is not just a deterministic autoencoder, but actually all of these mappings are actually pro conditional probability distributions. So you have a P of X given Z and you have a P of Z given X. And ultimately, you'll kind of match these two distributions using the elbow in variational inference. All right. So let me tell you of how about how these models are actually going to uh, are currently used when you want to actually use variational inference and variational autoencoders in the context of data compression. Um, so typically, you know, you would start with an image that comes from some data distribution PFX. Uh, you would then uh, push that image through a trained um, encoder network, um, F phi, um, and that would ultimately result in a vector of uh, real valued numbers, right? So for example, that could be the mean of that um, uh, inference distribution Q of Z given X. Um, now this gives you some dimensionality reduction, but unfortunately this is not enough, right? Because you only achieve compression if you really sort of truncate these uh, real valued numbers. You can store as much information as you like in a real valued number. And actually this is what a lot of compression algorithms such as arithmetic coding do. They just map everything to a, a, a number with a lot of decimal places and use that as a compressed representation of your input. So you have to do some truncation. And um, so that usually amounts to some sort of rounding to a discretization grid. So for example, that could be an integer grid. Um, so now you have a discrete vector and um, a discrete vector can be actually losslessly compressed um, using a density model over that latent space. Um, so you need some sort of probability model over that grid in latent space, um, which we usually use the prior for because the prior is sort of um, the only unconditional distribution in latent space that we have. Um, so you kind of use the prior for estimating these probabilities and that allows us to do some lossless compression, right? Now you have a lossless compressed representation of that discretized vector. To undo this, we just undo lossless compression. We get our vector back and then we push it through the decoder um, and that ultimately gives us the uh, an image. Um, of course, it's not the original image because there's some distortion happening due to the imperfectness of the dimensionality reduction and also the rounding operation. But we sort of hope that this is then ultimately close to the original input. The objective function that you would try to train such a model uh, turned out to be exactly the variational autoencoder. Um, so historically speaking, um, there was sort of another community that came up with pretty much the same loss function. And then later people discovered that this is really just the elbow of variational inference. It's actually discovered by the same author a little bit later. Um, and um, yeah, and so this is just the familiar evidence lower bound that we saw before. And um, to just kind of make sure that this makes sense to you, um, you know, log P of P of a Gaussian is just a quadratic. So this is really just some um, reconstruction error. And then this here um, is, is really the rate term. So it kind of um, gives you, um, you know, as you know, from lossless compression, um, the uh, expected code length um, is essentially the cross entropy between your data distribution and your, your model that you use for compression. And so that is exactly 
um, quantified by that KL divergence. Okay. So I got started uh, getting interested in compression while at Disney, and I, uh, this project actually started with something completely unrelated, namely disentangled representation learning. So um, I had a, a very strong intern, Ying Zheng Li, back then, who is now just got a professorship actually at Imperial College. And um, so we both worked on an idea of learning disentangled representation in videos. The idea was that the hope would be that we could kind of disentangle static information from dynamic information, such that when we condition on the static content, we could sample multiple different dynamical uh, trajectories in high dimensions, or we could sort of uh, fix the trajectory and replace the content essentially. Um, and the way we achieved that was uh, using just some kind of you know, graphical model with uh, certain neural network connections that are not indicated here. Uh, essentially, it's a sequence of uh, latent states Z1 through ZT. And there, in addition, there's also a global state F, such that F affects every single frame of that video, and Z is sort of a low dimensional time series corresponding to the motion of the frames. Right? So, in this in disentangled representation learning framework, we hope to um, achieve that F captured everything static and Z captures the latent dynamics. And in fact, that was um, easy to be achieved, at least for these relatively simple videos. And with that, we could sort of, um, you know, uh, first of all, generate content, but then also conditionally generate either on static um, content or dynamics, as shown here. Now, um, interestingly, um, you know, back then I thought that, you know, when you're actually good at predicting, um, you know, the next frame of a video, couldn't you actually use that for compression? And that actually got me interested in compression. And, um, and we kind of came up with the first um, uh, compression paper. So um, the idea here was that we kind of looked into the literature, we found the ballet uh, VAEs for image compression, and we just kind of adopted that idea for video compression using our disentangled sequential variational autoencoder. Now, so this is sort of the architecture. I just don't want to get into much detail, but essentially it's the same idea. You just kind of you know, use the model both for nonlinear dimensionality reduction, and you also use the sequential prior to kind of do good entropy coding. And you ultimately use arithmetic coding to compress uh, the frame successively into a very long, um, a very long um, real valued number where uh, the decimal places encode the entire video. Um, so interestingly here, actually, this global state F is something similar to an iframe. Um, hopefully, I'm not confusing the notation here. But that's essentially also very commonly used in video compression, where the first frame is stored with a very high precision of a subsequence of videos because it sort of informs the compression of the subsequent video frames. right? And so using this uh, construction here, we kind of sort of achieve something similar to, um, to an iframe by having that global latent state F. Yeah, so the first results were sort of interesting. I mean, they're not really state of the art yet, and I'll show you much more exciting results later in the end of the talk. But essentially, what we showed was that when you train these models on low resolution videos, you actually kind of um, get really good results if you train and test on very low entropy distributions and, and similar content, in other words. So, for example, uh, you restrict yourself to, um, for example, this mo moving robot arm. Um, so, uh, you know, this is kind of the spare video data set, but we also looked at downsampled YouTube videos. And so here are the results. Um, so without going into too much detail, what we care about in compression is actually the trade-off between rate and distortion. So in other words, when I'm allowing for larger rates, so larger file sizes, I'm hoping that I get better quality reconstructions. And so this year, PSNR is essentially the, something like the negative exponentiated um, error. So larger is better. So you kind of hope to be in the top left corner here, small file sizes at good quality, right? And so this is where the neural codecs are in these highly specialized situations. But it was actually more challenging to kind of get it to work on real world video. And then I'll tell you more about that in high resolution contexts later. But before we get there, let me actually tell you about a slightly different project, um, which was termed Variational Bayesian Quantization and published at ICML last year. And this is actually different in the sense that we didn't really design a model for compression, but we were interested in given a trained model, like a trained VAE, or maybe just a Bayesian neural network, um, how can we actually optimally compress the contained information in that model in post-processing? In other words, without changing really the training paradigm um, of how that model was trained 
And so to kind of in what follows, I'm basically tell you about the following uh, things. So we designed a new algorithm that um, operates completely after training in the sense that it's a plug and play compression model for pre-trained models. Um, it works both for data compression and for model compression, as long as you can interpret those parameters as latent variables in a, in a Bayesian uh, variational inference framework. And it separates the, as, as I said earlier, it separates the modeling part from the quantization and, and compression part. So that can be very practical, you know, if you, for example, design new models that you ultimately want to use for compression, you can, you know, for the moment, forget about the compression task and only kind of be good at generative modeling, right? And then compress everything in, in post-processing. Yeah, the other thing is that it's actually a variable bitrate compression scheme. So um, usually in, in neural compression, you have to train a new model for every bitrate that you're hoping to achieve. And this year um, takes one given model and you can actually quantize it differently and it gives you an entire rate distortion curve out. We also showed that the simple approach outperforms already JPEG with the single standard variational autoencoder. It also exploits posterior uncertainty for compression, which is uh, something new and um, pretty interesting as well as I'll talk about in the next few minutes. And um, in order to kind of get a little bit more into this idea of how do we actually exploit posterior uncertainties in compression, um, which is currently not oftentimes done, let me remind you of um, like an example from, uh, from our everyday word or language usage. So imagine that you asked me, um, you know, what is the population of Rome? And I don't know if you can actually read all of this. Oh, sorry about that. Let me jump across. What is the population of Rome? Um, so um, I might look up Wikipedia and um, give you an exact number: two million eight hundred, uh, you know, seventy-nine thousand seven hundred twenty-eight. But then, if you specify uh, your question, said, well, I was actually referring to the year eight hundred A.D. I might again consult Wikipedia and come up with a different number, namely 100,000. Now, why are, not, why are you not surprised by these very differently looking numbers? So obviously, uh, I've already kind of truncated a lot of decimal places. I've very aggressively rounded my answer for the year um, 500 AD. And the reason is that both you and I probably implicitly expect that there's a lot of uncertainty associated with that number. And I'm automatically sort of incorporating that uncertainty in order to kind of achieve a very small bit string such that I'm not bothering you with too much details. Okay. So when talking about numbers, we sort of automatically include uncertainty. And the question is, can we use this uncertainty, in particular posterior uncertainties also when for better image compression? Okay. And somebody here is, I think, not muted. Um, that's, um, <clears throat> All right. Let me first talk about uncertainties um, or probabilities in regular compression. Uh, so the standard paradigm of compression is don't transmit what you can already predict. And that's very natural. Um, and for, for us dealing with generative models, it actually means that better generative probabilistic models should lead to better compression rates. Right? And that's very natural because we know that the minimal bit rate is actually the negative log probability of our message under the model. And the expected bit rate is always larger or equal um, to the cross entropy between our data distribution and our distribution that we use to encode it. Right? In other words, our model. So what I want to talk about next, oh, sorry, uh, before that, um, let me actually explain that idea on a more practical example that will become relevant later on, namely that of arithmetic coding, which is an algorithm for lossless compression. So imagine you have, um, discrete outcomes or a probability distribution over 10 possible events with some sort of histogram distribution um, indicated as here. Uh, so we, we assume we have some prior distribution over these events, P of M. And now um, I want to encode the outcome of one of these draws. Right? So what I do in arithmetic coding is I compute the cumulative distribution of that discrete probability distribution. And it turns out that there are actually two of them there is an upper cumulative distribution and a lower cumulative distribution. The upper one includes the probability of the event, for example, five, and the lower cumulative distribution would kind of sum over all of the end events up to five. So including four, but not including five, right? So those, this gives us these two different step functions. Now, when I observe an event, for example, seven, I'll just kind of look up the corresponding difference between the upper and lower cumulative distribution. 
And I'm using that to actually map the event to a subinterval of the interval 0 and 1 on the y-axis. And now it turns out that I can use any number in this interval to encode the event, right? Because I can always go back from here down to there. Right? And it turns out that this is optimal because it kind of takes these probabilities um, uh, into account. Right? Um, so what you also see is that um, the larger these uncertainty regions become, the more choice I have in choosing a representative number. And what I'll typically do is I pick the number that has the fewest decimal places. So for example, here, I would kind of choose 0 0.111 in binary notation, uh, because if I would chop off another decimal places, uh, place, it would kind of get me out of that uncertainty region. If you're some, somewhere in the middle, you can actually compress that very cheaply because that uncertainty region is so large, and you can just kind of pick one half, which is 0 0.1, only one bit. All right, and you'll understand why this is relevant later on. Um, what I want to talk about, um, don't transmit, uh, is a different paradigm, namely don't transmit what you're not sure about. Um, so in other words, better estimates of posterior uncertainty should allow for better compression. Um, so let me um, study that on a very briefly, the idea on a toy example, since you're all familiar with Bayesian inference. Um, imagine you kind of have a linear regression model that you want to compress. So in other words, just a, um, a straight line, in other words, a slope and an offset. Let's assume that this is your, your data distribution. Um, so let's assume that this here is the optimal fit that you would like to compress. Um, the first thing is you go to um, parameter space where um, your model corresponds to a point in AB space. And now you decide on the discretization grid. Um, you would typically choose the model that's sort of closest to you on that grid. And then if you would reconstruct it, you will see that, of course, you'll do an error, right? Yeah, the discretization step has just um, involved some sort of error. Now, as Bayesians, we know that we can do better. Um, you know, we know uh, in Bayesian uh, modeling, we not only get a point estimate, but we get an entire posterior distribution. And oftentimes, there's sort of um, a very different uncertainty associated with A and B. Um, now, instead of um, just picking the closest point in parameter space, we're essentially deciding on closeness by taking the probability distribution into account. And for example, we might decide on um, a grid point here to quantize uh, on the on the for B that is very rough, um, for example, um, involving fewer decimal places, but we may, might want to decide to invest more bits in order to encode A. In other words, keeping more, for example, of the decimal places. And so we'd rather choose this point than that. And then actually, when you reconstruct, you're actually um, much closer to the original model. Right? So this is kind of the high level idea of what we're sort of trying to achieve. Um, how do we do that exactly using the Bayesian posterior? Um, so this is again the example of arithmetic coding that I talked about earlier, um, where um, again, we're, convert we're converting outcomes to uncertainty regions uh, or sub intervals on the interval zero and one. Now let's do something similar for continuous data. So first of all, in, in variational inference, we have um, a prior as well, right? This could be, for example, a normal distribution. And for now, let's kind of focus on a one-dimensional setup. Now let's assume, uh, okay, so the first thing we do is we compute that prior's cumulative distribution function. And that, that allows us to kind of go back and forth between um, the latent space and the interval zero and one. Now let's assume we make an observation, for example, an encoded image. And we want to kind of now use a similar idea to compress that image. What, naively, what we'll do is we'll kind of just use the CDF to kind of map it to a point uh, on the real value, at, um, uh, a point between 0 and 1. But now we're sort of stuck because that point in general has almost um, has infinitely many decimal places with probability 1 because it's not going to be a rational number or something similar. So that naive approach doesn't work. Now. Remember that you don't only have your maximum likelihood encoding, but you have an entire variation of distribution, Q of zi given x. So what we could do instead is we not only encode the most like or take into account the most likely um, point of our Q distribution for encoding it, but we take more of it into account. We also take the variance into account. So we can actually take, you know, map this entire distribution and also its variance using that CDF to another unnormalized distribution on the interval zero and one. And now this kind of gives us the notion of an uncertainty region in a similar way as we had for our arithmetic coding. 
But now we're sort of facing a dilemma. We can actually pick multiple points to encode the outcome UI. We could kind of choose 0 0.111, which is closer, which is get, gives us a better reconstruction because it's kind of closer to that point. But we could also try to invest to kind of invest fewer bits. In other words, picking 0 0.11 and use that for our reconstruction. But that would, have, on the other hand, would kind of get us further away from the most likely encoding UI. But now you see that this gives us an entire trade-off curve, right? There's not, not a single correct answer. There are actually multiple answers, and every answer gets uh, get us to a different point on the rate distortion curve. And that's exactly what we're going to use for um, you know, compressing and post-processing. Now, the thing is, you can do that um, if you work with factorized variational distributions. You can actually do that independently for all dimensions, which makes the scheme very scalable and very efficient. All right. Yeah, so what does the VPQ algorithm ultimately do? It kind of distributes a given budget of bits optimally among the latent dimensions um, such that you kind of get good reconstruction or high posterior probability under that, um, under that model. All right. So the nice thing is that it actually really applies to totally different models. Um, so for example, you can compress uh, both um, word embeddings and VAEs. So those are actually, um, and many more models. So those are my examples here. Uh, so what do I mean by compressing word embeddings? Um, so you all know word embeddings, um, and you know you know that you can do semantic reasoning with them, right? So if you have uh, the vector king minus man plus woman, you would sort of expect a vector that is close to the vector of queen. And this can be actually quantified by looking at the hits at ten. So in other words, is the answer queen among your kind of your models most likely ten embedding vectors? Now what you can do is you can actually use that as your distortion metric. And you can now sort of um, quantize your Bayesian word embeddings more and more aggressively. So it turns out there are also Bayesian word embeddings that need for this approach. Um, and of course, you know, if you quantize more aggressively, then you, know, you would expect that your hit at 10 metric goes down. right? So you get some sort of rate distortion curve shown here. And now you can actually do the lossless compression stop, uh, step with different, um, different lossless compression algorithms. And, each one sort of gives you a different rate distortion curve. However, if you do it with our approach, um, we do much better. Um, and the reason is sort of that we're not really tied to uniform rounding or quantization. Every data point gets quantized differently and less or more aggressively depending on its posterior uncertainty, right? And, and so that actually leads to a sort of much better uh, rate distortion and, and a much better compre lossy compression for these models than the naive approach. So you can also do that for image compression using variational autoencoders. Um, so that, again, I emphasize here that this, this is no fancy architecture. You just take a trained VAE trained on, um, on image patches, and you see how well it performs if you sort of discretize it in post-processing. Um, so first of all, this is kind of the JPEG bat baseline uh, in terms of uh, rate distortion. Um, so again, you want to be high in the top left corner. And this is the you know a relatively state of the art neural compression approach. However, that trains individual models for every point on the RD curve. So this is in some sense the golden standard. You cannot expect to be better than that model because it uses the same architecture and it trains a different model specifically to that bit rate. Now the more fair comparison is that you know you train the same VAE and you quantize it differently, and then you do sort of lossless compression on these quant different kinds of quantizations. So you can quantize differently in many ways. You can quantize uniformly. You can do some sort of clustering quantization. And then there's also the generalized Lloyd algorithm, which is doing something slightly more sophisticated, but essentially related. And then you get kind of these rate distortion curves. Right? So this is really what happens if you discretize a trained model in post-processing uh, in the naive way. Now, what we achieved is to kind of be somewhere here. We're not quite as good as the best uh, trained models that are using the same architecture and trained to every point on the RD curve, but we are pretty much better than everything else. And in particular, we are better than JPEG, which is sort of telling us that this is actually a reasonable approach that you could actually use. All right. So this was an interesting project on just compressing and post-processing, but it was not yet giving us state-of-the-art image compression results. So let me actually spend the last minutes of this talk um, to really talk about getting state-of-the-art results for both image compression and also for video compression using these sort of more advanced variational inference ideas. 
And, um, and here's just like a reminder of how you do compression in the VAE. So remember, we um, again, we push our image through the encoder. We get a dense latent state. We round it. We use the prior as an entropy model. We kind of losslessly entropy code it. And then we can decode it. We can decompress it. And ultimately, we reconstruct the image. Right? And the objective function was that essentially of a variational autoencoder. Now, the fact that these two different terms in the elbow rate as the distortion really measure the expected bit rate and the expected distortion, you might actually wonder, um, you know, could we actually get better rate distortion performance if we use trick of the trade variational inference approaches that are very popular, of course, in the generative modeling community, but that might have been underused so far in the image compression community. And the inspiration for this project uh, was actually gotten by an earlier paper that I did with another very strong intern, Joe Marino um, at Caltech and uh, Yisong Yu. Um, and the idea is that of um, the amortization gap and iterative inference as a way of solving or closing the amortization gap. So remember in traditional VAEs or amortized variational inference, you have some sort of um, you know, elbow L that you optimize as um, you know, essentially over all possible variational distributions. So in some sense, it's a, a functional um, that you optimize over a function class. But typically, you know, the function class is fairly restricted in that you know, we're, uh, we're just outputting the optimized variational parameters by um, a shared um, inference distribution that takes the features xi of these data points as an input. Right? And so ultimately, we are only minimizing over these um, or maximizing of these shared inference parameter networks phi. Now, instead, um, in the old fashioned way of doing variational inference, you would actually not do amortization and you would rather treat these mu's as individual optimization parameters. And you would directly optimize over these mu i and maybe variances also um, in, in, a, in an EM fashion, right? That you kind of uh, first uh, optimize the variational parameters and then you do a global update step on your model parameters. And if you do that, you kind of, oh, sorry, then, you know, the elbow for a given data point kind of gives you some sort of non-convex optimization objective that you can solve using gradient descent. And we actually showed earlier that you can actually get something much better um, than just the inference network if you're allowing for sort of a learning to learn framework to um, iteratively improve the elbow over iterations. Is that related to semi-amortized partial inference? Uh, yeah, I think there are, there are different names for it and um, yeah. That's true. There are a couple of related papers around the same time. Yeah. So we called it iterative uh, amortized inference. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> all right. So can this trick be actually used in the context of image compression? Um, first of all, um, let me actually tell you about the state of the art models that are nowadays used to really get good performance. And it turns out that they're not simple VAEs, but rather hierarchical VAEs. Also, they are highly local in the sense that they're kind of using relatively large latent spaces and only convolutions uh, to kind of preserve a lot of the information about the image to get good, good reconstructions. Uh, but yeah, ultimately, they're really two layer VAEs. And the idea is essentially that you want to learn a good density model of a Y, because Y is the part that you discretize and compress. And you want to really have a, a good flexible prior of a Y. And you kind of achieve that flexible prior by introducing an additional latent variable that you sort of Ideally, you want to integrate out, but you can't. And so you just kind of also point estimate that latent variable Z here, right? And then you kind of encode Z with a global prior P of Z. You encode Y with the conditional prior P of Y given Z. And um, yeah, and, and that's what you do. And then kind of during training, or sorry, during inference, you would just uh, use these inference networks. You get a dense, uh, a real valued Y and a real valued Z, which you would then round um, to kind of do the, that inference for the image. And during training, you would kind of replace the rounding operation by, by additive noise as, as, as one option, right? Um, so that's pretty common. Yeah, and so the RD objective, again, is just that of, an, of a hierarchical VAEs with these two different sets of latent variables. Right? The limitation is that, again, uh, this is amortized inference, and both mu z and mu y are actually predicted in one shot by the encoder, and there could be an amortization gap. There could also be a discretization gap because you know you're not doing the same thing during training and during inference. That's like another another story. So what we did in this year's NeurIPS was we actually identified several suboptimalities uh, in the current way of doing neural image compression through the lens of a variational inference. 
In um, particular, we you know, pointed out this amortization gap that was, again, very well known in the variational inference community, but not so much in the compression community, which just, again, tells you that you can do better if you do fine tuning of an individual images latent encoding as opposed to only optimizing for, for the global network parameters. Another gap is that discretization gap, which tells you that um, there's actually a mismatch of how you use your um, objective function and how you train it, right? You train it using noise injection, but then you actually actually evaluate it only based on discretized uh, Zs, right? And um, so it turns out that in, to, in order to close this discretization gap, again, in a trained model, what you can actually do is you can sort of essentially solve a, a discrete optimization problem for uh, finding um, a better point on the RD objective based on the inference network's initial guess. And this is actually done by um, kind of a new way that we uh, term stochastic gumbel annealing that kind of really get, gives a significant performance boost, as I'll show you later. And the third innovation in this paper was that of uh, pointing out a marginalization gap. So, um, you know, it turns out that in these hierarchical models, uh, you know, ideally we want to sort of integrate out Z in order to kind of have a powerful prior of a Y, but we cannot really do that. And it's that we have to point estimate Z or do variational inference over Z. And, but there is actually a trick called bits spec coding that allows us to kind of get you some of the bits back. Um, and, and that was actually known to work only in lossless compression. And here for the first time, we actually got it to work for lossy compression in these hierarchical architectures, which is not completely trivial because you have to actually make sure that certain operations are completely reversible for the encoder and decoder. And you have to think about um, sharing random seats. And, and I don't want to get into too much detail here. All right, so let's see how important these identified performance gaps are. Um, so this year is a whole bunch of um, kind of uh, uh, state of the art or kind of recently proposed image compression models, both from um, you know uh, neural compression, but also from classical compression. For example, JPEG is actually not the best model by far. Um, you know, BPG is a very good classical image compression model. And actually here in this plot, what we do is we plot the rate savings. So the relative rate savings of different algorithms over a baseline as a function of the quality level PSNR. Right? The baseline that we picked here is BPG because that's sort of the state of the art classical image compression model. Right? So all of those here are better than BPG and all of those here are worse than BPG. So what we essentially showed is, or what we did is we took a trained model again by Min et al from 2018 and we showed that only by improving the inference and post-processing, again, in the trained model, in other words, doing uh, you know, fine-tuning latent variables, doing discrete gumbel annealing, um, we could actually kind of get a performance boost of uh, 15 to 20% in rate savings over those baselines. And then if we also allowed for bit spec coding, um, then we actually kind of got the blue curve here, uh, which you can argue about whether it's worth the extra work or not, right? But I mean, clearly, this discrete gumbel annealing makes a huge difference. So if you look qualitatively at tiny image patches, so this is by far not a high resolution image. This is a kind of tiny patch from, a, from, a, from an actual test image that we looked at. Um, kind of you look at um, like the baseline, which is this Minon 2018 paper, and you wonder how much better does the reconstruction get if I allow for iterative inference and these tricks, then you see actually that you kind of get significantly more details out. Okay. So the last topic that I want to talk about is sort of a less polished part um, because it was just accepted at iClear. And so this is really now showing you that with the viewpoint of generative modeling and um, variational inference, you can also get state-of-the-art video compression algorithms that now really work in high resolution videos and that um, really are better than classical baselines. I should say that this is actually a pretty competitive field and it's actually a little hard to, to, to uh, compete there. But, um, but we, 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 did, we, we got some, um, some interesting results that I would like to share. So what is the general paradigm of both classical and contemporary neural video codecs? Um, so it turns out that um, there are these three aspects. Um, so first, you typically learn some sort of mapping of your previous frames to the expected next frame. So in other words, you're trying to predict the next frame. right? And um, so this, of course, saves you some bits because you know the more you can predict, the less you have to memorize. Um, but oftentimes, these mappings are actually parameterized by certain kind of local, you can call them local latent variables, uh, if you take on your Bayesian hat, uh, 
And, and those parameters are separately stored and compressed. And now whatever remains, whatever cannot be predicted well, is then separately compressed in a residual model. Right? And it turns out if you look at different architectures, they all sort of share these properties. I'm not going to really go into details, but this is sort of how we summarize them. Um, you know, there's some sort of autoregressive component, and then there are some parts that are stored, and they're sort of combined in different ways to get you a good reconstruction. So the question is, can we sort of summarize all of these approaches in terms of a master model in the language of generative modeling, um, a deep latent variable modelings, and use it to actually design better codecs? And, and here's sort of our suggestion. Um, so the most general class of models that summarizes everything that exists, and of course it can probably be, be expanded in the future, looks at, as follows. It's sort of a combination of an autoregressive model and a latent variable model in the sense that um, your next frame x hat is going to be predicted by um, an, a deterministic mapping h mu of the previous frame and some additional latent variables. Um, so in that sense, it's not, um, if you sample them, it's actually not uh, deterministic. It's actually giving you a distribution over next frames. But you kind of compress or store these latent variables of that transformation. And then in addition to that, there's some residual components, right? And usually that's just additive. Um, so what we did is we actually, um, in the sense of these um, you know, autoregressive uh, models like NICE and so on, we actually also introduced a scale parameter or transformation here that knows about the previous frame x hat. And that is also knows about that previous frames latent variable w. Um, and then that, that gets multiplied by this residual uh, noise model that now sort of compresses uh, w, but also v which is, um, again, the latent representation of, of that, um, of the residual. So here's a way of thinking about it in pictures. You have your previous frame. Uh, for example, this dog that shakes its fur. You see that there's a lot of detail here around the water droplets that are very hard to predict. So the prediction model then typically gives you like a blurry prediction in this region and everything else is relatively sharp because the model understands that there's nothing really going on here. So the scale parameter here um, kind of tells you about the expected uncertainty. So in other words, it can think of that as kind of trying to guess of how much to trust the deterministic prediction as opposed to the residual model. So it kind of almost gives you this like attention-like map here over the dock. And then this here would be how the residual model looks like. It's kind of a very noise picture, essentially that's easy to be compressed. And ultimately all of this is, yes. Could you comment more about the structure in the decoded proposed scale? It looks like it almost has a grid in there. It, it almost has a what, sorry? It looks like almost a grid on the decoded proposed scale. Oh yeah, um, yeah, those are, those are certain artifacts that come from these um, uh, specific um, uh, ballet uh, dis, uh, compression models at certain rates. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not completely sure if I have a good answer here, but it has something to do with the convolutions that are being used. Oh, thank you. All right. Okay, yeah, and so ultimately adding everything together kind of gives you a good reconstruction of the next frame. Um, so here's sort of how uh, to think about it. Um, so what we did, we actually proposed sort of a more data-driven approach compared to other baselines and we sort of expanded this model in different ways. We, first of all, we identified W and V as latent variables and we introduced structured priors over them. We also introduced the scale parameter um, and, and this is now how to analyze these videos. So here's again, this doc you see um, this is sort of this, um, uh, you know, the scale parameter mapping that kind of uh, tells you what's to be expected to be predicted and what not. And here, those are sort of plots for the rate savings of these models over certain ba uh, baselines, right? And so the rate savings are sort of uniform um, across the image. You may, might argue where you save more rates over, over the baselines. Anyways, those are kind of fun to look at. All right. Um, yeah, don't want to bore you with too much detail, but this is kind of just telling you that you kind of really get better video codecs if you only care about rate distortion. Of course, there are lots of unsolved problems in terms of how to make those efficient and really integrate them into uh, engineering pipelines. But if you only care about rate distortion performance, those results are actually pretty good and better than what has been proposed before, uh, which actually gets me to the summary page um, already. Um, so uh, what did I talk about? Uh, I talked about variational inference um, as it provides a better path to uh, path to better compression. So um, you know, if you're particularly mathematically minded and you like these variational inference methods, uh, I find uh, neural compression to be a, a nice uh, applied area of research and very rewarding and also uh, 
kind of nice to see all of these ideas play out in a, in a very applied context. Um, we first talked about posterior refinement. Um, I mentioned that uh, iterative amortized inference paper, which kind of amortizes the EM loop um, in the sense that it's sort of um, not quite as cheap as amortized inference, but not quite as, ex as expensive as iterative in inference or EM, but kind of getting, some, getting you something very close to EM. I also talked about um, variational Bayesian quantization, which was this idea of exploiting posterior variances in trained models. And again, that could be applied to uh, both uh, unsupervised models like VAEs, but you could also just compress neural networks or uh, Bayesian word embeddings. Um, I also talked about really improving the inference for state-of-the-art image compression using these, um, uh, you know, exploiting these different suboptimality gaps like uh, the discretization gap, the amortization gap, and the um, um, and the marginalization gap uh, relating to bit spec coding. And and finally, I talked about this most recent paper very briefly, which is very applied um, about autoregressive video compression. So let me also take the chance to thank my group, in particular the students who are working on this. Um, so Ivo Yang did a lot of uh, work here in, in, in these variational compression uh, lines. Um, so you just kind of got his third paper on the topic published, and, and Rian is also a student working on primarily on video. Um, and Robert Bandler was a postdoc for many years, and now just got his professorship in Germany. Um, so thanks to him as well. The last thing that I would like to point out is um, an upcoming iClear compression workshop that I'm also involved in. Um, so what we're trying to do here is we, we're, um, as opposed to the already existing compression workshop at CVPR, we really want to kind of encourage uh, crazy ideas and more mathematical ideas that might not necessarily already stay, achieve the state of the art, um, but that are still sort of deserving attention. And also we want to draw the links to information theory in, in this workshop. So please feel encouraged to all submit your papers there as well. That's pretty much all I wanted to say. Thank you so much for your attention. And um, I'm here for your questions. I have one question, if uh, possible. So sure. I discussed here uh, mostly image-related uh, uh, data. And I assume that in all of it, uh, it wasn't autoregressive representation, right? So the image uh, conditioned on Z, it was independent. Yeah. Pixel. Yes. Did you try to deal with an autoregressive mm -hmm. um, data, and how did you handle the dreadful uh, posterior collapse? Yeah, that that's a great question. So, um, so it it actually turns out that there are autoregressive models, um, both in data space, um, but also in latent space. Uh, so, in other words, autoregressive priors in Z space. Um, so they have been proposed, and they generally perform better. Um, the only reason they're sort of not really considered. Um, I mean, my, my impression is that they're not as, as popular anymore because they're so slow. Um, so they're not really practical in terms of speed. Um, so there, there are papers that propose this both for video compression and also for image compression. Um, I think we might have even included it. Uh, I'm not sure if it's actually here. Um, could be that this Lee paper did that. I'm not completely sure. Anyway, yeah, but but yeah, these ideas exist, um, and it's maybe maybe an efficiency uh, argument why they're not as as oftentimes encountered. Thank you. Uh, an excellent talk, by the way. It was very interesting. Okay. Thank you. Can I just follow up on that question. So uh, I think it's, it's I think the answer might be exactly the same. But my question was why um, why is it that the hyper prior models are sort of state of the art when you it seems like you could probably do better with an autoregressive model in the latent space? Is it is it simply this? Uh, this issue of uh, efficiency? That's a good question. I mean, I, I think actually, I'm not sure if there's kind of a, um, a comparison between sort of a one layer VAE with an autoregressive uh, prior and a, and a two level layer VAE with a hyper prior. I mean, the hyper prior is extremely established. I mean, I, I can only assume that, um, you know, there, there's this kind of Google group in particular, like uh, Minan and Ballet, they're all kind of in the same team that they've probably tried it out and came to the conclusion that this is the best architecture. I mean, there are now also other architectures. There's a recent Europe's paper that combi combines this whole VAE again with GANs, and of course they, you know, get better qualitative results. Um, but, but yeah, um, yeah. Back to your question. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not completely sure about this comparison, but I would assume that this hierarchical VAE is pretty good. Again, I mean, this it really improves the um, 
yeah, it's, it's kind of really yields a good density model essentially in latent space. And uh, yeah. <clears throat> All right. I mean, if there are no more questions, um, then. Uh, yeah, if there's I mean, no more questions, here. yeah, we can probably wrap up here if there's no That's more right. questions. Um, I posted it on Slack, but for anyone who didn't see it, uh, Stefan has made some time available for meetings. So if you're interested, uh, find my message on Slack and there's a Calendly invite to sign up for a time. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for your talk and thank you to everyone for coming. Great. Thank you too. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Bye.